Welcome, dear listeners, to Horror Den of Misfits. Story time. I spent the last six months living inside an abandoned RV. This was not by choice. I've spent a long time thinking about to word this. As time's gone on it's becoming clear to me that I should be honest about my mistakes, although I have no desire to give my identity away. Still, I can't just stay silent. So, should I start this like a talk at a conference? Should I slowly work my way to some massive justification for my life's work? I could tell you how my work could, potentially, have offered new ways to deliver complex medicines, or offered philosophical insights into the past and future of life's organization, or even created blueprints for strange new robotics that would let mankind conquer the stars. Or maybe, perhaps, I should actually be honest. I studied slime molds, and I did it because I liked feeling like the smartest person in the room, so I picked a topic few people could challenge me on. The problem was that I was very impressive to most lay people, but within my field I wasn't particularly well recognized. I dealt with taxonomic classification, and was, for all intents and purposes, a lab assistant. Our field team collected lots of samples, and someone had to organize them, categorizing the molds and ordering them, looking for anything that stands out. I've joked that I've discovered more species than any other scientist, I just never got the credit. That might actually be true. But it's also true that I spent almost all my time running through a fixed battery of tests. Researchers sent me dirt, I developed cultures, tested them, and if anything was unusual, I would send it off to a genetics lab for testing. Any papers that got published would have me listed as an author, usually sixth or seventh, I was forever lost in the et al. But for almost 99% of the time, The tests came back with the same old results. Somewhere above me were other more celebrated scientists who were looking for novel species that might do strange new things. That's where the robotics and medicine stuff comes from, of course. Don't forget, penicillin was a mold, just like the things I look at. But I wasn't saving the world. I was doing the same old shit day in and day out. Mine was the boring work that needed doing to save other people time and money, while I jealously waited for a chance to prove myself to the older academics. That chance, I thought, came with Melissa. It started with a small sample of mold sent to me along with hundreds of others, one I would later come to name Melissa, after my late sister, whose favorite color was turquoise. To this day I don't know exactly where Melissa came from, just that the note on her file seemed like a joke to me. So I ignored it researchers occasionally slipped references into the notes for a bit of fun. Either way, Melissa was one of many strange unidentified organisms who we share this world with, picked out of some dark forgotten corner where she had been overlooked, and then shepherded to my small basement level laboratory. She was a shimmering, almost metallic beauty with vivid pulsing veins spread along her pastel cloudy hues. She looked like a psychedelic explosion caught in time, and staring at her microscopic structure, felt like being transported to an alien world. Even at first glance, I knew she was going to be special. And oh boy was she, starting with the fact she never got a single maze wrong. She could home in on food with remarkable accuracy, the kind you might expect from an actual organism. After about 50 trials I was getting ready to write up the unusual nature of Melissa's success when I noticed the sample in the maze had what appeared to be some kind of dirt in it. A closer look showed a tiny black orb the size of a salt grain embedded in her bluish flesh. They reminded me an awful lot of a clam's eyes, and acting on a hunch, I decided to place some card that obscured the location of the nutrient packet, and then run a few more trials. I remember thinking it was such a stupid idea. If anyone had asked why I'd done it, I would have struggled to come up with a sane idea. Eyes are multicellular and complex. Slime molds are simple. That kind of specialization just doesn't exist in their kingdom, even in the more complex fungi. But Melissa was full of surprises. What she did next was quite really quite remarkable. She simply crawled up the maze wall, regrew her eyes for it was now clear to me that they were eyes in a new location, 
and used the vantage point to identify which branch to use before solving the maze all over again. I must have repeated that experiment a hundred times, but eventually exhaustion got the better of me, and I called it a day. Before I left, I sampled Melissa to grow another dozen samples, providing them with plenty of nutrition to encourage growth. I knew that the next day I'd need to go through an awful lot of very rigorous tests, and I very much wanted to be prepared. When I returned the following morning, I was utterly enthralled to discover that Melissa's growth was successful. I now had over a dozen independent samples of her, which meant I needn't worry about working with a limited supply. Once again I set off to work, and while I can't go into tremendous detail, I will say that Melissa was truly something special. Over time it became obvious to me that she possessed rudimentary powers of information processing, and could readily call into effect cellular specializations with as little as 60 minutes preparation. Of course that might not sound very incredible to you, but try growing a third eye in one hour, and let me know how easy you find it. And there were more than just eyes. There were special fibers, microscopically shaped like small springs that, under certain electrochemical signals, could tighten. These were no more than a few nanometers across, but in one demonstration Melissa wove hundreds of thousands across a wall well, a bit of playing card I'd sellotaped to the maze, and buckled it to clear a path to food. In another demonstration she used specialized digestive juices to break down a plastic wall, chemically engineering the necessary enzymes to break apart the laminated business card. I had to work with very limited supplies you see. In another set of trials performed in total darkness, she grew a myriad of tiny hairs across her surface, and used them to detect faint vibrations in the air. Not only did she use this to solve the maze in record time, tracking an artificial beeping sound, I used to indicate the correct path, but she later used this same trick to recognize sounds like my footprints. Pretty soon Melissa learned to detect the correct path just by the sound of the food packet being dropped into place, regardless of light conditions, so I had to create dummy packets to properly control the experiment. There was no end to her magic. When I presented her with some acid-resistant plastic Tupperware to you and I, Melissa developed a series of chitinous hooks to grind and tear it apart. Of course, it took four hours, but it looked quite ferocious when sped up, like a sea of knives come to life. Fascinatingly, I also found that if I trained one sample of Melissa with half of a puzzle solution, and trained another sample with the other half, that once combined the two samples would successfully integrate both halves and solve the problem completely. In fact, just a few cells from one sample transferred to another could impart significant knowledge. By the time the day ended, there must have been a large amount of knowledge spread out between the 12 samples. Melissa was a once-in-a-lifetime discovery, and I so desperately wanted her to myself. I was going to do my tests, I decided, record them appropriately, and have all the proof necessary to show everyone that I was more than just a lab monkey to be overlooked. I left work that day feeling ecstatic, barely able to contain my excitement. This was the kind of thing that would have people from every department knocking on my door. Computer scientists, neuroscientists, psychologists, mathematicians, and doctors alike would all want to work with me. I fantasized all evening about cancer curing molds trained to detect and consume tumorous tissue, plastic eating organisms solving world pollution, and engineered molds that could grow enough nutritious fruit to end world hunger. Unfortunately, the next day I returned to find that someone had nudged the 12 individual samples closer together possibly looking for more room on one of the shelves in the refrigeration unit. Either way, Melissa sensed herself and reached out across the various dishes cracking lids where necessary and reassembled her various parts into a single sample. It was no larger than a dinner plate by the time, but it meant none of my individual samples could be tracked. Any hope of continuing specific experiments from the before were dashed, and I had to resolve to start all over again. Or at least, that was my intention. Unfortunately, some of the tricks Melissa had learned were quite vivacious. Initially I tried lifting her with my latex gloved hands, but soon felt a prick as I slid my finger between the glass shelf and her cold flesh. 
Pulling my hand away I noticed a small needle-like protuberance embedded in my flesh. It was hardly deadly, but afterwards I found myself feeling trepidation at the thought of touching her again. I'd never been stung before, and certainly never by my own work. Still, a nearby spatula let me pry her away, and I quickly set to work with some knives. I'll admit to feeling a bit reprehensible as I watched Melissa struggle. First, she oozed thick acid to try and melt the knife, but that was futile. She tried fixing some of her microscopic filaments to my skin and the handle, perhaps to gain some leverage, but she was far too slow, and they snapped pitifully as I sawed away. I watched as her flat, glistening form rippled in display threats, and also saw strange patterns of hooked flesh that looked much like the inside of a shark's mouth rise and clash against the cold steel to no effect. Eventually, and this was the part I found hardest to deal with, Melissa stopped her attacks and grew even more primitive black eyes and furry patches of ear to watch her own mutilation. And of course, to watch me. She never flinched though, not even after I had separated her into dozens of pieces that sadly never stopped trying to reach each other. After that she became non-compliant. She stopped trying to solve the maze and instead focused solely on me. The only instance of activity I ever saw was when I dropped a small paper clip on the testing area and Melissa assimilated it before I had chance to reach it. I tried pinching it out as she sucked it into her pliable body, but succeeded only in getting stung once more, this time by a far longer and slightly curved proboscis that javelined out towards my hand by a good 5 or 6 inches. I laughed at the time, amazed at how there was no end to her marvelous abilities, and simply accepted the loss of stationery. But afterwards I found myself increasingly disappointed with just how difficult it was to get any work done with such a hostile subject. That was a disappointing day. There was no testing or growth of any kind, just me bumbling about as I presented novel stimuli in the hope of eliciting new behaviors. By the time that day ended I wondered if Melissa had learned as much about me as I had about her and I sullenly returned the various Petri dishes back to the fridge. That later turned out to be a mistake. The fridge was filled with over a hundred other samples, and I returned the following day to find them destroyed. Not only was this a grotesque loss of over three months worth of my academic work, but it appeared that Melissa had absorbed precious specimens and contaminated herself along the way. Strange fibrous protrusions crossed various shelves and Melissa now significantly larger than before, was slowly turning every other sample around her a glistening iridescent shade of turquoise. I decided that I would no longer be able to do this on my own. Melissa was simply too tenacious, and the stress was already robbing me of sleep. I'd barely been in the lab for an hour and already I could feel a headache coming on. The stress and excitement were getting to me, so decided to bring in a colleague to cover for me while I rested. If anything, it'd be good for them to confirm my prior findings. I reached out to a good friend, whose identity I can no more share than my own, who arrived at my door only a few minutes later. They looked awfully concerned as I sat and explained each and every one of my experiments to them. The poor man was obviously incredulous at my claims, but by this point I was so exhausted, and my nose so blocked and my stomach so sore that I had no desire to argue with him. Look, I said. The sample is in there, and it speaks for itself. Just take a look while I catch up on some sleep, and then you can apologize at not trusting me. He laughed at that and let me go on my way, probably because I was so clearly tired and disheveled that he felt the need to humor me. I might have been surprised at how bad I felt at the time, but I've long since been familiar with just how bad sleeplessness and exhaustion can affect the mind and body. Old cuts don't heal, slight infections grow aggressive, colds are prolonged, headaches more severe. Even as I collapsed onto the cot, I took a moment to consider just how badly swollen Melissa's stings were. They throbbed and ached, stinking of infection, and I decided I'd need a course of antibiotics, if they showed no sign of healing by the time I woke up. Then, with blurry vision and a pulsing headache, I quickly drifted off to thoughts of Nobel Prizes. For the first time in two nights, I found myself dreaming. 
They were profoundly unusual dreams, even for someone who studies slime molds all day, looking much like beautiful fractal patterns and brightly colored shimmering flesh. It was as if someone had turned a living person into some kind of modern art, taking the vivid and rich purples of bruised flesh, and the pallid sickly yellow of jaundiced skin and intertwined them, weaving a tapestry out of threaded skin and nerves. It was all a dizzying kaleidoscope of abstract sensations and images that left me feeling deeply sick. So much so that the first thing I did when I awoke was vomit into a nearby wastebasket. God, what a rancid mix that was that which fell sloppily out of my open mouth, as I shook feverishly over the bin, barely able to hold myself upright. There were visible blood vessels buried in that strange rainbow-colored spew, thick blue capillaries that shivered and moved like dying fish. I decided in that moment that I desperately needed to visit the doctor, and went to tell my colleague about my need to leave work smiling to myself that I'd also get to hear him tell me I was right about the miracle mold only to be confused when I saw him lying on the floor through the glass partition. Somehow, and I'm still not sure how, my friend must have slipped during the testing. On the countertop was a slick pool of blood and his head was open from a nasty gash, just above the ear, quite likely from where he struck the counter as he fell. Panicking, I pushed open the door and pulled my phone out ready to call emergency services. But after looking up I was forced to stop after only a few steps. The lower half of my friend was covered in the bumpy irregular shape of Melissa, whose slimy and embrace had inched its away up his legs like he was a fallen tree waiting to be digested. My God, I cried out and ran forward. Starting at the sound, my friend opened his eyes and looked at me in a daze, most likely unaware of what was happening. Don't worry Harold, I cried. I'll get it off. I reached forward and grabbed a thick lump of Melissa, she was now easily a meter squared in size, and as thick as a deck of playing cards, but I instantly felt a terrible pain shooting up my arm. Good God it hurt. It hurt worse than anything I've ever felt, like a hundred thousand tiny burns. Immediately blood flowed out from under my gloves, and I tore my hand away with a terrible sound, not unlike velcro straps being pulled apart. What was left of my skin looked like a fleshy cicatrix, and under other circumstances I might have fainted out of sheer pain. But my screaming had awakened something in Melissa, and she reared herself upwards like tsunami, and revealed a terrible sight. There was barely anything left of my friend below the waist. She had dissolved muscle and skin, leaving only softening bone in a yellowish stew that gurgled audibly. I looked back at my friend with new horror. He shouldn't have been alive. Slowly his mouth opened, and he rasped, without moving his lips. Help, in a voice that wasn't his. Get away, I screamed, and suddenly his torso lunged at me. It filled me with terror, the way he moved like a tongue to Melissa's lips, hungrily searching for me. It was almost like a punch in Judy Dahl, his body visible only from the waist up, the puppeteer hidden by the curtain of rippling mold that coated his legs. I easily kicked his hands away from my legs, and just as quickly as I had entered, I fled the lab and slammed the door shut behind me. Pressing my back up against it, forcing it shut, I took a moment to catch my breath, jumping momentarily when the door jostled from Melissa. She could sense me beyond, and slowly a shadow was cast across the room from behind me as she slithered up the glass in search of my flesh. I turned and saw an enormous writhing mess of cilia and gaping sphincters that winked aggressively, sometimes bearing teeth, hungrily pressing against the glass like a starfish at an aquarium. Then came a familiar hissing as digestive juices began to break down the door and its wooden frame. Quickly I stepped away just in time to avoid a dozen spindly spider-like legs flicker under the gap towards my heels. It was clear to me now that I had grossly underestimated Melissa. I could no longer act like she was anything but a direct and immediate threat to my life, so I decided to go for the simplest solution of all. I lit the room on fire, starting with the door she was trying to break apart. Thankfully there were lots of dangerous chemicals on hand, and they all burned very, very hot. It was actually quite odd watching her react to that ancient threat. Melissa quickly realized that the only exit was blocked by the flames, 
and many of our laboratories are designed to be controlled environments with very little risk of contamination, offering her few routes to leave. I could never really say if she did or didn't escape of course. I just knew I needed to aggressively stop her getting through. I also decided that perhaps my best chance was to disappear, maybe even hope that the half-eaten remains of my charred colleague might be mistaken for my own body. That's not to say I had a clear plan in my head as I fled the lab and university, rather just some kind of peculiar instinctual desire to flee, which I did in a desperate and haphazard manner. I left my whole life behind that day, driven by some overwhelming compulsion to get the hell away from that room. In some ways, it was almost like my mind wasn't my own. It has since become clear to me just how stupid I was. I have been forced to live in this wretched broken down caravan, far away on a Hebridean isle somewhere in the North Sea. I'm not even entirely sure what's left of Melissa, or where she went after the fire. Sometimes I have apocalyptic nightmares of her slowly digesting the whole world but I often remind myself that she was, after all, a natural species found on this earth. For all I know she just returned to wherever she came from, some obscure pit or dark underground chasm perhaps. Or perhaps she found the perfect place to hide already. Maybe she's like me, a scientist interested in exploration. In which case she's found herself quite the playground. What things will she learn there, I wonder, if only it didn't have to be so painful. It was only recently that I awoke and went to touch my feverish head, wiping away the sweat. But I was startled to find that what touched my moist skin was not my hand at all. It felt like an awful lot like a sock. I forced my eyes open, and I saw that a thick teal velvet glove had somehow been placed on my hand. I tried, quickly, to peel it off like it was a glove, but my thumb sank into the flesh below like I'd grabbed a piece of rotten fruit. Slowly, the horror dawned on me, and I tentatively reached forward and snapped a finger off. It crumpled in my hand, effervescing powder into the still air as I crushed it in one fist. Slowly, my sanity fading, I crumbled the rest of my hand apart until I was left staring at the pulsating hairy flesh of my exposed arm. Even the bone was soft like papier machete. Since then, it's just kept getting worse. And the dreams. Oh God, if I could just sleep in peace, then maybe it wouldn't be so bad. Still, I do have one consolation left. At least I finally get to be part of something bigger than myself. This happened to me while on a night fishing trip with a friend in Ohio in 2016. We had a place to park and hiked in three quarter of a mile, maybe a little further. We found a decent spot, and had a small clearing. We weren't out in the middle of nowhere. However, this was not a place where you would expect to run into anyone. As a matter of fact, the spot looked as if it hadn't been used for a good long while, surrounded by tall trees, very tall grass, and some muddy swamp-like areas that were absolutely covered in tracks. I sat and tried to identify as many as I could. I've always had a fascination with tracking. I think I know why and I'll mention it at the end. I cannot believe how many tracks I found as if this area still belonged to nature. Deer, raccoon, coyote, turtle, and several different bird tracks. There were no human tracks and nothing out of the ordinary. It was a beautiful little fishing spot with no noise pollution and no sounds of human life. It was perfect. We set up camp after I scoped out the area. As it began to get dark a slight fog rolled in, and we put our jackets on, started a fire, and got our lines in the water. It was a very dark night, not much moonlight. But we had our fire and our headlamps for sight. At around 1 o'clock in the morning, my friend was cold and wanted to get warm in the car. I was not agreeable to this as I've been taught from a young age, and with many years of experience in the outdoors, this was not the ideal time to separate from each other. I reluctantly agreed, and we hiked back to the car. Now, had he been there for what happened next I might not have had to keep this to myself for all these years. I continued fishing, and was having a decent night. It was a catch and release trip, and I had already landed a few nice sized channel catfish, and a turtle. I was sitting in my chair and started thinking, I wonder how long he's going to be in the car. 
I really didn't want to be out there by myself in the middle of the night in such an isolated area. Keep in mind, the only noises were insects, frogs and turtles, and I spotted the eyeshine of a raccoon in the trees directly across the river from where I sat. It was a peaceful night until this happened. I didn't smell anything and my hair didn't stand on end. However, I could feel it. The ground shaking that is, with every bipedal step this thing took shook the ground beneath me. I cannot describe the sound of these footsteps. Each step shook the ground around me for a split second. Earthquake crossed my mind, but it was just a fleeting thought, you know, when your brain tries to immediately make sense of something you can't explain. I had no idea how far off this thing was when it started, but I quickly realized it was running at me. I tried to regain my composure and remember hearing the last few steps. Boom, 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 and it was standing just out of the firelight right behind me in that very tall grass. Then it went quiet all around me. Silence, as if every living thing in that area knew to be quiet when it came to seeing what I was doing as if a room full of rowdy kids were just startled by the sight of their father. I remained quiet as well. I didn't dare shine a light in this direction. I'm convinced it was coming to investigate why I was there. I continued to fish as if nothing was wrong, even though I was scared, which is not a feeling I get very often when in the wilderness. I have a substantial amount of experience in the wilderness. I don't know which way it went, but I knew it had left when the cricket started back up. It left without making a sound. It was as if it wanted me to know it was there, but not where it went. If it had decided it didn't like the cut of my jib, I wouldn't be typing this to you now. Thank goodness it wasn't in the mood to rip me apart. I know it had to weigh every bit of 800 pounds. When I was sure it was gone, I drew my sidearm, as if that would stop this giant, and walked swiftly to the car to get my friend to come and help me carry our equipment out. I was done fishing. He was asleep with the heater, and the radio cranked way up. I'm almost positive if he had not had the radio on it would have woken him. I can't say what direction it came from exactly, but I think it may have either followed him or went to the car and checked him out first. He asked why I had my gun out and where was the equipment. I didn't say a word, I just told him I needed help to get it. We left shortly thereafter, and I didn't say much to anyone for the next couple of days. I know they Bigfoot exist. I always have. I didn't see it, as I didn't need to. I could have easily shined a light in this direction and laid eyes on it. I have no desire as there are many different beliefs surrounding these creatures, and simply laying eyes on one can be considered a sign of very bad luck. I can't remember where exactly I heard that, but I'm sure it came from the stories my great-grandfathers used to tell me. On my mother's side, her father was a full-blood Cherokee, and on my father's side, my great-grandfather was a Blackfoot. I believe this is where my fascination with tracking comes from. They are long past. I believe the stories they told were first-hand accounts, and not fabricated in the slightest. Those of us who know would give anything to that kind of knowledge. I encountered a reptilian hybrid a few years ago, while attending college in Oregon. This individual was extremely manipulative with words and dangerous with their deeds. Once I told him that he was a cold-blooded bastard after he humiliated a friend. He became very angry, staring at me with a hideous glare. He said I would suffer, for my disrespect. That night while studying in my dorm room, I was alarmed by a shadowy figure starting to manifest. I am sensitive to energy, so I immediately started to raise the vibration in the room. It quickly dissipated. That startled me, so I was on full alert. Later that night at approximately 2 am I awoke from what I thought was a dream, but alarmed by a grotesque reptilian form on top of my body attempting to choke me. It screeched and wailed like it was taking great delight in my fear and pain. I struggled and finally threw the fiend off me. As it cowered on the floor glaring at me, I immediately knew it was the individual I had insulted earlier. It thrust itself at me. I reached for my pants on my desk chair, in order to retrieve my pocket knife. It was choking me as I pulled the weapon from my pants pocket, and toiled to open the blade. I was able to push it off, 
long enough to slash it across its left arm and upper chest. With a howl of rage, it ran to the wall and disappeared through it. I turned the light on to fully illuminate the room, and noticed blood on the knife, bed sheets and floor. I checked myself to make sure it wasn't my blood. I was awake the rest of the night and ready to strike if I needed to defend myself. I was exhausted in the morning, but made my way to class. I noticed the individual coming out of his dorm room. He had a bandage on his left arm in the same spot where I had cut the reptilian. He noticed me and walked directly to me nose to nose. He glared at me with those evil reptilian eyes. Watch your back because this isn't over, he murmured. I walked past him and made my way to class. Later that day, the dorm staff and housing administrators wanted to talk to me. While I talked to one of the dorm staff regarding this individual, the administrator blurted out, don't provoke him, it's important that you not cause trouble for him. The dorm staff was obviously terrified of this guy and behaved like his minions. This was startling. That same night I felt wary of a presence watching me. That sense of dread continued for several weeks until I moved off campus to avoid this hostile individual. However, I often noticed him and his acquaintances blatantly watching me when I was on campus and in town. I know that I wasn't the only person affected by this guy, but no one ever dared to discuss it. Many strange things happened as well, including the sudden death of two students in that same dorm. No details of those deaths were ever disclosed, just that they died because of medical reasons. I know others are out there who are aware of the reptilians, and that there are ways that humanity can use to defend itself against them. I have been fortunate to meet several people who safeguarded themselves and family. These terrible beings are a scourge that we will continue to confront. Be safe. I would like to pass along a true story told to me by my grandfather when I was a young man. The story involves my great-grandfather, whose name was James McNamara. He was a patrolman in the New York City Police Department. This incident occurred in October of 1911 during the late evening hours. James was assigned to the theater district, in the area of Broadway and 42nd Street. Another patrolman, by the name of Dobbins, was two blocks south on Broadway near 40th Street. Theatergoers were walking about and enjoying the Great White Way, when suddenly screams were emanating from an alleyway just below James' position. Both patrolmen ran toward the ruckus, forcing their way through hundreds of fleeing pedestrians. As they reached the alleyway, a tall hairy beast ran out onto Broadway and towards 40th Street. Neither patrolman could believe what they saw. An eight-foot tall wolf with human-like arms and legs, running with skill and speed down the middle of Broadway. Soon the beast was facing a NYC Packard squad car, so it changed direction and moved back towards McNamara and Dobbins. The beast was growling as it moved forward. The patrolman took positions by a newsstand, hiding and waiting for the horrible creature to move before them. Soon the beast was at the entrance of another alleyway near 42nd Street. Both patrolmen pulled their revolvers and took deadly aim. The beast quickly dropped to the gutter. Immediately McNamara and Dobbins surrounded the body as other officers joined them. None of the public was allowed to come within 100 feet of the unknown canine. The body was quickly removed and taken to the mortuary. Both patrolmen were placed on other assignments. The squad was told by their superiors that this was simply a mistaken identity, and that the deceased was a man in a costume. Of course, that was not the truth. The press was later told that a large mad dog caused the disruption, and that none of the public were injured. A few months later, a brief article was published in a Louisiana newspaper. I live in the Navajo Nation in Arizona. This took place in the Cheska Mountains in the 1980s. My friend was about six years old, and was up in the mountains for a family reunion at the family cabin. The cabin is in a meadow with a stone well near the tree line. They spent the day doing typical reunion things i.e. three-legged races, flag football, and whatnot. The sun starts setting and the families retire to the cabin and call it a day. 
The older people planned to sleep in the two bedrooms and the kids would sleep on a bed or cot set up in the living room. All was well and the kids were tucked into bed. My friend let's call her Sandra is uneasy and reluctant to go to sleep. She is wide awake as everyone falls asleep. Sandra tosses and turns, unable to shake her weird feeling. Suddenly her feeling turns immediately to fear as she hears something big, something heavy making its way across the porch. Sandra fears that it may be a bear looking for food, little did she know it would be much worse. She could make out the shadow of something large and black as it passed the window. It is making its way to the door. She sees that the family didn't lock the door. Sandra is watching the door, too scared to move or scream, she sees the doorknob rattle back and forth. Whatever is trying to open the door, succeeds. The room floods with the most putrid stench, and she sees a large human hand through the door. Sandra finally summons her strength to scream, Dad. Her father runs in and sees Sandra pointing at the door. He sees the hand, runs to the door, and yells, Hank, his brother grabbed the gun. Whatever was at the door ran. It was a full moon, and in the moonlight, they saw the creature run across the yard. Hank with a hunting rifle in hand looks through the scope, and sees the creature crouching behind the well. Sandra's father assumes it is a bear and tells Hank to shoot. Hank pulls the trigger and hears the bullet ricochet off the well. All thought of this being a bear is diminished instantly when the creature stands up on two feet and runs towards the tree line. They never saw the creature again. These are accounts from my partner I mentioned in the first post, for background his grandparents live there, and he would often go there for summers and breaks for school. It's unsettling and definitely informal since these were talked about in a group chat. There was one night when I was a kid when I couldn't sleep so I was sneaking out to the computer room to go play webkins or something silly, kid stuff. And as I was walking past those big wall to floor windows facing the woods leading to the computer room, there was something that wasn't quite a person and wasn't quite an animal on the back porch, crouched, pressing its face against the glass. I don't know if you guys have ever seen that video of the rabid coyote that is snarling up against a window or a glass door, and it's like smacking its muzzle into the glass all violently. It was like that, that same feeling of danger and wrongness, that little kid me was like almost hypnotized by it. It was just standing there and trying to push through the glass, and would sometimes smack whatever kind of mouth it had against the window like it was trying to bite or break the glass. But eventually I snapped out of it, and ran back to my room, and didn't come out until morning. Another one I was present over the phone was this. When we were long distance before 2020, he would call me frequently while I was doing school work. It was pretty late, and he calls me and says there was a massive shriek-like scream that happened down the road from him. If anyone is familiar with hearing a guttural scream, you know how unsettling and icing it can be. It freaked him out a bit, and we heard a crash happen. He lived off of a massive highway with crop fields on either side. The fields had these rain banks that ran between them and the highway that were about five, six feet deep. A little after the scream, we hear a crash, metal on metal of two cars crashing. Soon after, sirens flying from down the highway past his house. He has me on call and decides, as any Midwesterner would, to go see what's going on. He gets to the police barricade, and they tell him to turn around, and, you'll hear about it in the news. And that was it. He couldn't see super well, but there were police activity in the field, yards away, looking at two different, crumpled cars. The next morning, he goes out, and, while the wreck was cleared, there was still debris. There were signs of two cars being there, deep into the fields, like they had been tossed or thrown. No real news happened on it at all, besides town rumors that, drug deal went wrong, was the only explanation. Date was Deck 27, 2019. This is an account by a few of us, on this note from our document we share. The airport runway that goes on with no end at night, the woods and surrounding grass pulls you towards it. Strange shadows in the grass. There is an old airstrip near my partner's home at the time. It's one of those small, 
private aircraft runways with a few hangars, and no security at all. The runway is planted in a field, with lots of woods surrounding it. I've been to the airstrip a few times, and every time it was not fun. It scared me straight out of the gate, it was eerie and too silent to be in the woods. We've had a few interesting things happen, but the main one was not being able to walk to the end at night. On foot, you would be able to walk to the end of the strip in about 5-10 minutes during the day, and in a car both at night and day. On foot, we had never been able to reach the end at night. We had walked it several times just the two of us, or in a group with other friends, and every time, we could walk for what felt like hours with the dim lights of the runway stretching into the distance, never growing closer to the end. A few of our friends reported feelings of dizziness or wrongness on these walks. My partner told me stories about a junkyard that was also back in the same woods behind his grandparents' house. No fence or security, nobody else ever there but cars or chunks of cars ranging back as old as the 70s in various states of disrepair, or with trees growing through them, or practically seeming to be sunken into the ground overgrown with bramble and weeds. He says the whole place was eerie quiet, no birds or animals around other than the faint smell of rot and rust or cat urine. One more, this one is on the night train. The last train of the night gave my partner, and the friend we had that lived in town nightmares. Our friend had them more often, but the train would seemingly run way too long, honking for hours. My partner mentioned when it came through, it would sound and shake like it was right outside when it was across town from both of them. The train noises would distort for me, waning and pitching incorrectly while making my hair stand on end. It felt wrong and horrible, causing panic attacks and terrors for my friends and me. This is a super long post, but I think it's worth it. Let me know if you have stories or know anything weird with this little town. So this happened when I was about 9 or something I'm not completely sure. My friend and I were playing in my room with Barbies, but took a quick break when she had to pee. I decided it would be fun to hide behind my door to scare her. When I stood up and wanted to hide behind my door, I saw some sort of creature. I always thought of it as some sort of alien, but it could be something else. It certainly did not look human though. I don't know exactly how it looked, but I have a vague memory of its appearance because it's been so long ago. When I saw it, I felt intense fear. I could not move or breathe, and my heart was racing. I don't know how long I stood there, but eventually, I walked out of my room, and my friend came out of the bathroom. We both went back inside my room and resumed playing. At that moment, I did not remember what happened, but I still felt extremely scared. I must have looked scared too because she kept asking me if I was okay. I'm not sure when, but maybe a few days or weeks later, I started to remember what happened that day, and became extremely scared to sleep. I never told my parents and kept it to myself, they just had to deal with me being scared lol. I told my little brother a few years after it happened, but every time I talked about it, or every time he joked about it, he didn't believe me, I would freak out, and this intense fear would fill up my body. The image of it standing there, and the fear I felt stayed with me. I recently talked about it with my oldest brother, because my younger one brought it up as a joke. My oldest brother really believes it could be an alien of some sort, since he also believes to have seen one when he was younger. Does anyone have the same experience or any idea what this could have been? I'm also planning to ask my younger brother, if he remembers me telling him any details about how it looked. I have always believed in spirituality and supernatural existence but I have never had such a direct and validating first-hand experience with it. In July 2023, I was single and active on social media, dating apps, etc. I have an abundant mindset in dating, so I was messaging as many girls as possible, while I was single and looking to mingle. I had a false and idiotic sense of safety, apparently. I added a girl I had found on Tinder or something, but had never met in person on Snapchat a normal occurrence during that time, unfortunately. Instantly, I watched her story, 
and it was full of witchcraft, fortune telling, and other stuff along those lines. Before I could even finish viewing the stories, I got a message like, who's this, which is super understandable of course. And before I had time to respond, this person, in under a minute of adding me, blurted out my grandmother's full name and address, her dog's name, my mom's legal name most people don't know it, and she never goes by it my childhood address, my current address and potentially other details I had forgotten. They basically threatened me to leave them alone, and that they knew all this because one of their minions follows me. Of course, someone could find these things if they had enough information, time, and a bizarre desire for personal details. But we're talking 20 to 30 seconds or less. It was so fast in fact, that I don't even think it could have normally been typed up as fast as it was sent. It was as if it was copied and pasted. This shook me up enough to block them instantly, and to go through my followers and block any minion type people, lol. My family, including myself, had fallen upon some bad fortune since then, and I can't shake the slight paranoia that perhaps this person had cast something onto us. If you have any insight, thoughts, or questions on this, please comment, as I want to better understand what I experienced. I'm just gonna start by saying that this story isn't quite as interesting as some of the others, but I still feel like it's worth sharing. So this happened a few weeks ago Super Bowl weekend on a Saturday. One of my buddies came to visit me, and brought some of his friends with him, so there were four of us. Us being college kids, we did a lot of drinking that night, and by the end, we were all pretty drunk. But I remember I, for whatever reason, was challenged to go lift something at my 24-7 gym that's right across the street at about 3.15ish am. Me being drunk ass at this point said sure and went and did it. It wasn't until I started walking back that I saw a man in a suit with a fedora. Mind you, the road was completely empty, no one else on the sidewalks, just me and this man. I didn't think anything of it until I started walking back to my apartment, and he was just staring at me the entire time while walking in the opposite direction. I got to my apartment doors and noticed he turned the corner. When I got back to my apartment, I told my buddy and his friends what had just happened, and how creepy the whole thing was, especially since it was at 3.30 am. I know it's a possibility that since I was drunk, I may have seen something different than what was real. But I definitely felt something was very off, and when I told everyone, I remember feeling really rattled about it. What's y'all's opinion? In 1888, a mine owner reported his encounter with a 60-foot-long serpent monster, while crossing the Jornada del Muerto volcanic crater in New Mexico. What did he encounter? This section of the country has been considerably aroused from time to time by the conflicting reports of Mexicans, who say that the extinct crater to the east of the plain, known as the Jornada del Muerto, about 25 miles from this place, is the abode of a monster serpent, second in size only to that huge reptile of the seas that has so often been spoken of by mariners and others. It is reported by some to be fully 100 feet in length, and about 2 feet in circumference, but probably the most trustworthy information, is that given by a Mr. Alexander, who possesses some mining property in the San Andreas Mountains, which lie to the east of the broad plain. Mr. F Alexander says that he saw the serpent once, while crossing the Jornada on the way to his mines. He was about halfway across the plain, jogging leisurely along behind his burrow, dreaming of the immense wealth that he hoped to realize from his property, when suddenly the burrow stopped, erected his long ears, wheeled quickly around, and made a mad stampede in the opposite direction. Mr. Besh Alexander was at a loss to account for this strange freak of the burrow, and was about to start in pursuit of the runaway when he chanced to look ahead. Then his eyes gazed upon the monster. He was so beside himself with fear at first, he says, that his nerves were completely paralyzed, his hair stood on end, and move he could not. He was rooted to the spot, and his eyes were fixed upon the serpent. It was about a quarter of a mile from him, and was traveling in the opposite direction toward the crater. 
He says it appeared to be about 60 feet in length, but what surprised him most was the queer proportions of the creature. The four parts were of enormous size, its head being fully as large as a barrel. A few feet behind the creature's head two large scales were visible which glittered in the sun like polished shields. Further back were two huge claws on either side, about two feet apart, which were all the monster had in the shape of feet. The rest of the body was comparatively small and tapering to the end of the tail, it traveled at a rapid gait, sometimes rearing its whole body from the ground, and walked on its four claws. He watched it till it disappeared over a little hill, and then he started to look after his burrow. The Mexicans have the most deadly fear of the crater, and will not venture within miles of it, there being a popular tradition among them, that it is the abode of some terrible serpent. The Mexicans assert that on one occasion, a descent of the crater was made by their men, and as none of them returned, it was generally believed they were devoured by the monster. Over 10 years ago, I was in my 20s, sharing a townhouse with my partner. We were an end unit, connected only on the right side of the home to the rest of the houses. Had lived there for at least a year maybe two when this happened, and during that time, never once heard a single sound coming from our neighbors who shared the other side of our wall. One night, probably 2 or 3 am, I woke up to the sound of our neighbor coughing. I immediately recognized how odd that was because we had never heard them at all through the wall. The coughing continued non-stop and appeared to get louder to the point where it no longer seemed to be coming from our neighbor. But now inside my bedroom, like the origin of the sound had drifted through the wall toward me. The sound continued to drift toward me, and I was started to breathe very heavily like I was scared out of my mind. As it came to me and settled what felt lime two feet directly over me, the sound kind of morphed into a mechanical sound very similar to a scene from The Matrix where Neo's scream becomes synthesized. This crescendoed above me, and then suddenly stopped. My partner then woke up, not from the sound, but from the feeling of me panicking and breathing heavily. I told her what had happened, and she said something like, definitely just a weird dream half awake half asleep thing, but you do seem really scared. We tried to go back to sleep, but within a few minutes the whole experience happened again, only this time, my partner could hear it all too, and we were silently gripping onto each other very tightly as it was happening, now both of us panicking. I don't know why we didn't say anything or get out of bed, but we both had a, we need to stay quiet and not draw attention to ourselves feeling. It happened the same as before, and when it was done, we both turned on our bedside lights and spent the rest of the night awake watching TV. I have never heard someone else have this same kind of experience. The thought of posting this here is to see if it rings true for anyone out there. Back when I was a small child, like 3-5 years I told my mom multiple times that my dad had a car accident and killed his friend and I was there. She would put this off as odd behavior, and not think much of it, until she once told my dad, and he was totally shocked and looked at her like an insane person. Came out that before he was with my mom, he had a girlfriend, and while driving the car slipped, and they crashed into a car, where she died. There was no kid in there, but we can't explain, how I knew it happened in the woods, and that it was a crash against a tree. There were no kids on the car. It might sound crazy, but I can't remember this incident very much now, but since my parents somehow were involved with this case, it stayed a bit more in my brain. I apparently talked a lot of dumb stuff like telling my mom, remember when I was an adult back then, I always did X sadly she didn't remember what exactly and I don't either, only that I somehow always felt as a kid, I had a connection to events of past lives, but then got severed once I got older. So this was a while back, but it just came back to me, and I saw this channel. And thought I'd see if anyone could help me figure this out. Some context, I live in Virginia and have my whole life, and I've heard stories about paranormal events here and experienced them in my small town. One night,
Driving home after work at about 3 a.m., I was very tired, and I saw something with bright yellow eyes and very dark fur. It looked like a wolf or something. Beautiful, my headlights were on it as it ran across the road and disappeared. It was not a normal animal. I know that. It moved faster than a wolf and didn't run like a deer would. Ever since then, I hate driving down that road, and when I think about it, I get the same feeling I did when I saw it. If anyone can help me understand what I saw or thinks it's a Wendigo, please let me know. This story may just be one of dad's silly stories, but the way he described it gave me chills. I'm a 17-year-old male, and I live in PA. My grandparents own 94 acres. Recently, my father and I were riding up in the woods, and we stopped to enjoy the scenery. I ended up making a joke about seeing a skinwalker, and my dad told me about this time when he and his cousin had a sleepover, and they heard coyotes yelping and howling up in the woods. They got on the quad and drove up to see what was going on. They ended up not seeing anything, but it was on their way back that they saw something. My grandparents have this really small, beat up old shed. When my father and cousin were driving back, they saw a massive horned beast hunched over the shed. They didn't say a word, they just kept driving. When they got back to their grandparents' house, they went to bed and said nothing. My father is not somebody who would be afraid of anything paranormal. Of course, they were only teenagers at the time. My dad is now 50, and my cousin passed away a few years ago. Since that day, my father will not go into the woods unarmed. So I used to work at a nursing home. And most people would think that nothing bad would ever happen there. But that is all false. As most of our patients are the elderly, there is plenty of deaths that occur at our facility. So I worked down in the dementia care ward, and there was a lovely resident that I cared for, for HIPAA purposes, I'll name the person Beth. She was unfortunately put on hospice a few weeks ago, and she met her untimely death three days ago. She was 92. As a residential care associate it was my job to clean out the room for a new resident. As I walked in her room, it felt too cold, and that is weird because all nursing homes are always hot, because the elderly get cold easily. I just felt a kind of cold that's only bone chilling. I tried to shrug it off as I took the sheets off of the bed. As I was bending over to take off the fitted sheet, I felt a push. It felt like cold hands pushed me with strength I've never felt before. It happened so quick that I was just confused and scared. I quickly grabbed all the sheets, and booked it out the door. But when I turned my head around, I saw it. I saw a human-like figure shadow in the closet. It was a quick look so I couldn't really identify the person. But I can say for certain that it was Beth, playing a prank on me before she departed to the afterlife, as me and her would play pranks on another, while I took care of her. So yay that is my encounter with the paranormal. Hello everyone, I want to talk about some things from my past life, that impacted my current life. My mom and I are spiritual, and she contacted the spirit of my best friend yesterday when I was having a mental breakdown, he is from my past life as a Vietnam soldier. I got to know him since I was a young child, and we were best friends I can vaguely remember that his name was Damien or something, I basically grew up with him and his family treated me as I was one of them. Very nice family at that time, but once the Vietnam War started, things took a turn. During our deployment, I was very paranoid of being ambushed by the Vietnamese, so I slept with a gun in my hands. Due to all the mental issues going on at that time, and the dark environment, I accidentally shot my best friend, because I heard someone walking towards me in an odd way. I was devastated and turned batshit insane after that. I was no longer suitable for duty so they sent me home. I was full of regret, shame and grief. People around me were treating me harshly because we veterans, failed to win the war. And the family members of my best friend, even placed a curse on me out of anger and resentment, the curse that I would never be happy and fulfilled again. 
This curse haunted me in the current life, where I am reincarnated into. I always ask myself why I feel like I'm not worth it, or why the things in my life happen the way they did. Now I feel like the pieces of the puzzle are fitting together. The purpose of my current life is to lift the curse, and become mentally strong again. I can finally have peace with myself now, which I didn't achieve with psychotherapy before. Moral of the story. Unresolved mental issues and curses can haunt you in your next life. Be sure to cope with them, and be open-minded or disciplined to meditation. This way you gain insight about previous lives, and you can prevent yourself from making the same mistakes this time. I don't know if I should report this, or what, I just need some guidance. I'll try to keep it brief. Saturday night my boyfriend and I were heading home after a drinkless night out. I was driving and pulled up to a red light and told him keep an eye out for the green light for me. Because I wanted to check my phone. Now I always pull up on the white line. I hate when people stop short of it. I was fully aware and not sleepy at all when I said this. For additional context, I was going down a slight hill. I was up the hill from the light. So I would have had to roll backwards up the hill with my car and drive. I also have the auto parking brakes when my car comes to a complete stop. The next thing I know, I woke up, car about 40 away from the line by the red light. Confused and a little panicked, I muttered something like, what the hell, and my boyfriend sat up and said, what the F just happened. I snapped at him. I said let me know when the light turns green. I don't know. He said, how long were we sitting here, I shrugged. He says, my video played for 10 minutes, and went back through the video and didn't remember any of the video in the time that had passed. It creeped me out, I barely slept Saturday night. And Sunday joked about it to my sister. But today, on the way to work my boyfriend and I passed the same traffic light, so I asked him, what do you think happened Saturday? Weird huh? and he had no idea what I was talking about. I recounted the entire story as specific as I could. He didn't even remember getting home or the ride home. So, do you think something supernatural happened? And if so, do I report it? To where? Scary experience with my brother. So, this was in 2017. My brother was sleeping alone in his own room. As he was tucked in his sheets, he saw that the sheets were literally rising over him, as if something wanted to suffocate him under the sheets with no air supply. He was resisting, but the harder he resisted, the faster the sheets grew over him. He then said he tried to scream but couldn't. Then he heard a loud clang. Lord Hanneman's statue in our home fell down, and he could move freely now. He ran straight to my parents and sobbed. My parents were exchanging uncomfortable looks. I saw because I came out too. Then I noticed there was something like a black figure watching over us from about 5 meters away, waiting to attack again but couldn't. I believed it to be his nightmare, but I really couldn't figure out until now how a 6 feet statue fell down on its own, when it had been standing straight for 5 years. This is something I experienced as a teenager. To put in context, this was the post 9-11 years. I had a close friend whose family were naturalized citizens from a, shall we say, suspect country. For younger readers, I can't adequately state the level of paranoia and suspicion and harassment that happened then. It's similar to German Americans being harassed during World War I and II, or Asians being attacked after sea pandemic. Black sites, torture, and the Patriot Act allowing unconstitutional spying and privacy. But I know what it's like to be bullied, so I stood up for my friend, and due to issues at home, often spent time with them, at theirs instead. Twice at seemingly random times during the day or weekend, and I was told that this further happened when I wasn't there as well. It just happened that I was around at the time, a weird dark colored vehicle with unusual plates, not state plates, with a smaller designation than as usual, would show up at the house. Couple of guys in suits would get out. They were a little. Weird. 
I've never seen the man in black movies, but they were very tall and lean, the suits were very alike, and they spoke very carefully and held themselves very strictly and upright. They would greet my friend and I, but seemed more interested in talking to her parents. The first time this happened, I was a little freaked out, so my friend and I got a bit of money and went out to run an errand out of the house. I did ask what these people wanted, but didn't get a great answer, just that it was complicated, and not to listen at doors or tell everyone what they were doing. The second time, I was less freaked out, at least at first, and told my friend that we should go. But instead, one of the weird suit guys asked to talk to me. I was worried, but everyone said it was okay, they weren't going to hurt anyone, just answer questions. This guy took me to another room, gave me a business card with a name and government department on it in English and Arabic. I kept it for a while, but lost it during a college move, and started asking me questions about the family. Had I ever noticed any extremism beliefs, anything odd or strange that they did or said? I emphatically denied this, said they were nice, normal people, no odd beliefs, money issues, weird travels, no issues assimilating, didn't go into a lot of detail. I had very little media exposure at the time because my parents were strict about TV. But I did watch Law and Order weekly with my dad. So I figured he was a bit like a cop, and I shouldn't say too much. He was weird though, tall, lean but well built, and really pale with short hair. My grandfather was ex-military, so I could recognize a haircut as being within regulations. Does anyone have ideas as to what could have happened? Unsure if it's encounters with albeit strange actual intelligence personnel, or something else. Was it common at the time for people of certain backgrounds to be questioned, or used for anti-terror work? My older brother died about two years ago. He was in a car crash that fatally took his life after a drunk driver flew head-on into him. At first it was hard, but I progressively begin to heal and move forward. About four months ago, me and a couple friends went to Dave and Buster's. We ate and went to play games. I remember that me and one of my friends had gone to play Pac-Man. He wanted to reach the highest level possible. I eventually had to take a bathroom break, and I told my friend that I would be back. One of the older guys in the crowd who had been talking to us for a while agreed to take my spot until I came back. While I was going to the bathroom, I passed by one of the games. I believe it was a zombie game. I could see a woman and a man sitting inside. I should have passed by and kept walking like usual, but I stopped because I heard a voice that sounded familiar. I turned back around and did my best to peek inside without them noticing, just in case I was wrong. I immediately could see the buzz cut, the stud earrings, the silver watch, the scar on the elbow that only my brother had. I couldn't stop myself from calling out his name. A feeling took over me, and looking back now, I believe it may have been grief. I know the stories of people who see their dead loved ones, but this wasn't one of those. The woman kept playing the game, as she obviously hadn't heard me, but the man sort of tilted his head and looked at me. He looked exactly like my brother. He stared at me without smiling or any emotion. I don't know why, but I left immediately. I went back to my friend and told him that we needed to go. When we met up with my other friends, they were all confused and kept asking me questions about what happened. I told them that I would tell them later, and I just wanted to leave. We had to wait for an Uber, so we were going to sit inside until then. My friend encouraged me to go to the bathroom again, and said he would wait outside the door. I agreed and went. While I was washing my hands another person came in, and began to wash their hands next to me. I looked up and immediately saw the face of my brother. I didn't know what to do, I just stood there. He kept washing his hands, and he made eye contact with me a couple times. Everything about him was the same. His features, the scar, the accessories that he wore. It felt like hours, but it was only a couple minutes. He turned the water off, dried his hands and left. My friends told me that yes, a man had left, but they weren't really paying attention, so they didn't see his face, but they remember the watch. I know about the stories of people that see things that aren't really there, 
And I know that doppelgangers exist, but why would he look at me when I said his name if it wasn't really him? And why would he come into that particular bathroom, out of all the bathrooms he could have went to? I have tried numerous times to tell my mom, but she refuses to listen. She said that she is thinking about putting me in therapy, because I obviously haven't healed. My friends sometimes laugh at me, and tell me that maybe I saw a ghost or something, even though they also remembered the watch. I'm not sure what to believe, but I'm positive that wasn't my brother. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe for daily stories. We at Horror Den of Misfits really enjoy this, and your support would be appreciated.